Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank His Excellency uh, Vuk Jeremic and Professor Sachs for this honour today. It is a rare opportunity for a representative of a small island state in Southeast Asia to address such an impressive gathering of leaders in Southeast Europe. I do so in the spirit that our two regions share commonalities in the subjects of climate change and sustainable development. And I hope that my remarks can help you uh, have very important discussions today. On 1st November, global news headlines reported that the world has to move away from fossil fuels by the year 2100. This was the leading message from the final installment of several scientific reports issued this year by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which uh, Vuk had re referred to earlier. Even though 2100 is 86 years away, I'm certain that as political leaders and policy makers, this statement would have made you worry about what challenges you face to transition your energy needs away from coal and fuel oil to clean and renewable sources without sacrificing fiscal prudence, economic growth, and sustainable development. Big headlines like these are designed to grab public attention, but they often evoke very polarized responses if not taken with a deeper understanding of the issues. To really appreciate why we cannot carry on with business as usual and why we should adopt a more urgent response to climate change, let me share with you five other statements found in that same report from which I have removed the scientific jargon and any sensationalist overtones, putting it in plain English for you. One, greenhouse gas emissions from human activity are at unprecedented levels. Two, some of the many extreme weather events we witness have been linked to human influences and we only need to look at what's happened in the United States in the past 24 hours. Three, surface temperature of the earth will rise over the 21st century and sea levels will rise. Oceans will continue to warm and acidify from absorption of carbon dioxide. Four, many aspects of climate change and associated impacts will continue for centuries even if emissions of greenhouse gases from human activity are stopped today. Five, the risk of abrupt and irreversible changes increases as the magnitude of this warming increases. These latest warnings are a good catalyst for us to hasten our efforts at the international level, to respond in a more coherent and meaningful way. In 2009, Parties to the UNFCCC set a target to limit global temperature rise to below 2 degrees Celsius relative to pre-industrial levels. This target gives us a tangible frame of reference for our respective efforts domestically and guides the international negotiations for the new agreement in 2015 to succeed the Kyoto Protocol in 2020. Now, our negotiating universe revolves around many simultaneous issues, but I will only touch on two major pillars for today's discussions. The first is mitigation, which are the actions we take to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Some of these examples include switching to less pollutive options for energy or transportation, or enhancing energy efficiency in industries and in your homes. The second pillar is adaptation which are the actions taken to address the adverse impacts of climate change. And examples of these include measures to counter rises in sea levels, which small islands like ours face, coastal erosion, flooding, or ensuring things like food and water security in the face of extreme weather. Now, the traditional relationship between these two pillars is this. The more effort we put into mitigation, the more we slow or arrest climate change and the impacts caused by it. This in turn reduces the levels of adaptation needed to tackle adverse impacts. The additional point which has just been spelt out by the IPCC is that
that even if we manage to stop all greenhouse gas emissions today, we already have a stock of adverse impacts which will stay with us for centuries. The IPCC also suggests that there are multiple mitigation pathways within these immediate few decades to achieve the necessary emissions reductions to meet that two degrees Celsius goal. And these have a greater than 66% chance of success. However, if we delay additional mitigation, it will substantially increase the challenges. So the longer we wait to act, the more it will cost to adapt and mitigate climate change. Now this is the backdrop against which negotiators like me will meet in Lima on the 1st of December. In fact, I leave on Sunday already because there are preparatory meetings before that. You would be aware that there has been much skepticism and disappointment amongst the non-governmental observers about international negotiations. In particular, we can understand the impatience and anxiety of civil society stakeholders. Now, the UNFCCC may not be the only international negotiation which is taking a long time to reach an agreement. But the longer we take, the more serious the risks become. Impatient as we are for action, it is not that the governments value our planet any less than our citizens. Commitment to a global solution on climate change through the UN system has a deeper purpose. Now, Southeast Asia and Southeast Europe share geopolitical similarities. As small and medium-sized states, we often lack the influence or the sway that the major powers in the world have. Without the transparent and inclusive rules-based system which the UN provides, to ensure a level playing field in these negotiations, we would simply become price takers in a deal which affects all of us deeply. The UN system affords us the ability to participate as equals in these negotiations, so we have a responsibility to be active and to help build a good outcome. Working by consensus takes more time, but the strength of a consensus, a consensus decision at the United Nations must not be underrated. When a decision is reached by consensus, it binds all parties with no ambiguity over the rules to which we all agree. Now, particularly for the climate negotiations, we will recover our credibility from the Kyoto and Copenhagen situation by adopting a truly global agreement which enjoys universal support and participation. Parties have emphasized that this new agreement will be applicable to all. At the center of our ongoing negotiations is also a different approach to what we tried in the past. Our previous approach was to try to negotiate a global distribution of the mitigation effort and then externally impose this politically determined quota onto each party. As we witnessed in Copenhagen, this led to sharp divisions over who was more responsible or who was less for the state of our climate today. In Warsaw last December, parties altered how we approach this issue. Cognizant of the two degrees Celsius goal and taking into account our own national circumstances, parties agreed to table nationally determined contributions. You will hear this phrase a lot moving forward. It's short form NDCs, which will represent our self-determined best efforts to achieve that global goal and all parties will be part of this NDC effort. Now, parties recognize in Warsaw that this system was untested and there will be risks that we do not do enough because it is voluntary. Hence, we agreed that the NDCs will be tabled in 2015, well in advance of the Paris conference where we actually adopt the agreement. This form of upfront transparency of the pledges that we will make serves as a form of assurance, along with the fact that these contributions will be scrutinized not just by other governments, but also by civil society stakeholders, including our own citizens. To offer another characterization of this approach, our previous approach was a zero-sum game, 
which saw our climate actions and commitments as being at the expense of each other. If you did more, then I would have to do less. The new approach does not pit one party against the other. It is a standing invitation to lead by positive example, and the onus is on us, each one of us, to make our own best efforts, instead of asking the other party to increase their efforts. The NDC platform is an open and continuous opportunity to do more and to do better, with each government facing pressures from their own unique set of stakeholders and their citizens. In today's reality, sometimes domestic political pressure is often more powerful than external pressure. Last week, as already has been mentioned, we saw the US and China jointly announce their intentions in an effort to create momentum for Paris. Similar to what we saw after the European Union's earlier announcement, media and climate analysts have wasted no time pronouncing whether these intended pledges met or missed their expectations. The effect of public opinion serving as moral pressure has demonstrably already begun. It is premature for us to assess whether this NDC approach will take us immediately to this two degree goal. But what is important for us is that we have all parties on board a legally binding agreement, making an effort which can be continually improved. An analogy that's been used very often is, it is much better to have all the passengers on a train moving forward and we can increase the speed pro progressively. That's much better than all the passengers standing still on the platform arguing about what speed the train should move at. It is understandable that any new approach bears uncertainty. But we also have assurances to fall back on. Negotiators recognize that this new agreement will function under the principles and provisions of the UNFC, uh, UNFCCC, which is, after all, a framework convention. The first principles which provided the necessary disciplines and balance to bring all parties together in this effort will not be displaced or rewritten. This new agreement will catalyze new action under the same framework convention. Now, even as we cautiously pin our hopes on these negotiations, it serves to pause and remind you that no international agreement can solve all problems. However, it can and should form a strong and durable base for national actions, which are the key to improving the climate problem. Flowing from there, national actions must have the support and buy-in from our citizens their elected representatives, or we will not be able to meet the targets that we set ourselves. This is where leadership truly matters. While this new agreement will only take effect in 2020, we are fully capable of acting right now. And I think each of you in this room, including the many young people here who care deeply about this issue, each of you can motivate and convict stakeholders to act whether they are government officials, business leaders, or the average citizen. And this action can be done now, and it could be as simple as conserving whether electricity or water in your daily lives, or can be as complicated as a policy decision on a long-term choice of technologies to avoid a polluted future. Southeast Europe does not have the structural constraints which shackle many mature economies. Your emerging economies are still at a point where you can plan and achieve sustainable, climate-friendly future. This region can and should make progressive climate-friendly choices without waiting for a global deal. Regional cooperation can also help pool resources or create economies of scale in clean and renewable energy projects. If the countries of Southeast Europe can find common points on which to cooperate and unite, you can also present a regional voice at the negotiations, which will be far more compelling than your individual voices. So in closing, it is my personal hope that both at the global negotiations and at the national level, we will be able to change the narrative about climate action. Making responsible choices 
in climate policy need not be seen as conscribing economic growth or distorting sustainable development. With each government invited to make their own best efforts in climate action and to continually improve on this over time, the story should be about making good choices for the well-being of future generations. The tangible benefits will be more resilient cities and towns, better health, less hazards from pollution, and greater economic potential for investment and jobs in new technologies. These are very important topics which other speakers and panelists will address today. So I just want to conclude here by wishing you a very successful deliberations, and may your conversations today start to catalyze many positive changes in Southeast Europe. Thank you.